Good evening and happy Thursday. Welcome to another episode of Mid America Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shades Fain. We've got a full show tonight. Of course, our panelists are here to share their knowledge with you. And so let's jump right in and have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their specialty. So John, we'll start with you. Okay, I'm John Bodenstein. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener. And I guess if it's green and it grows, I like it. If I can eat it, that's even better. So. <laughs> Um, I, 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 there's no, I like annuals, perennials, trees, shrubs. The whole the gamut. Whole, the vegetables. Okay. All right. Next. And I'm Jim Appleby. I'm an entomologist at the University of Illinois in the Illinois Natural History Survey. So I work on insects, mites, attacking trees and shrubs. Now, some of you people may be aware of this, but WILL is sponsoring a train trip mm -hmm. from Chicago to Savannah, Georgia. And it's going to be from April the 6th, 26th, a Monday, that's a Friday, to Monday the May the 6th. And they will have pickups of people in Springfield, Decatur, and Champaign take you to Chicago where you can board this train. This train is going to be attached to an Amtrak train. And it has a dome car like this. If you've ever ridden in a dome car, they're absolutely so much fun because you sit up above the other mm -hmm. cars and you can see all around. And so there's gonna be a dome car on that train, somewhat similar to this, this model train here. If you're interested in this trip, call Tour Group Planners in Decatur. So it's Tour Group Planners in Decatur, Illinois. The phone number is area code 217-422-5002. And I'll repeat that number again a little bit later in the program, but I think it's gonna be a marvelous trip and it helps out WILL as well. So. Perfect. Okay, thanks, Jim. And last but not least. Hi, my name is Kelly Alsup, <coughs> and I am a horticulture educator based out of Bloomington. Uh, my expertise lies in house plants and greenhouse management. However, my passion is entomology, uh, pollinators, and beneficial insects. The critters, huh? Yes. Okay, all right. So we are live tonight. If you uh, would like to have us answer your question, try to give us a call. 217-333-3495 is that number. So, uh, John, we'll start with you with our show and tells. Okay, the first thing I brought today was a couple of pictures. Uh, this is uh, Petasites japonicus, and it comes in two varieties, the plain green and then the uh, variegated. And I was out in, in, the, in the wooded area, and this is what it looks like right now. And this is the flowering stage, and it's one of the first things that come up every spring. And it's just, you know, it's just, I, I know spring is here when I see that. Mm -hmm. But that's not the end of it. I, um, these, these things grow huge, <coughs> and they're, some people call them dinosaur food. Uh, another common name is butter burr or uh, colt's foot, but they can get up to 36 inches. Now, this isn't 36 inches, but this is one of them. <laughs> and I made a cement casting. This is a little bit heavier than what they are. They do like to be in a wet area and uh, they um, can grow up to, like I say, 36 inches uh, each. Um, mm. And, and the, you do want to make sure that you put them in a nice moist area. Shade is usually um, nice because once the sun comes around and hits them, mm -hmm. they kind of deflate, so to speak, but the next morning they're back up. And just an interesting plant. Um, Do they have a the, flower? Oh. Yes, this is the flower right here. Oh, okay. Are they uh, in the same family as Colocasia? I don't. The, the big elephant ears? No, no, no. no okay. No, they no. look. They have a yeah. similar look. This that's is, why I wonder. This is uh, 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 <coughs> different. This mm. is a. This is one that's from Japan and mm. China. It's not a, a native, gotcha. but it's one of those that I just couldn't, uh, that I, I have to have. And <laughs> it, it's so impressive. And I like to make the castings. Yes. So how I do make, they reproduce, John? Um, they make it by, by cat, they, they make by, by spreading roots. Oh, okay. So you All can right. see this is, mm -hmm. I cut it off. And then they also flower, but I've never seen them where they okay. actually mm -hmm. spread by flowers mm -hmm. or by seeds. Yeah, yeah. Nice. But, Thank you. Okay, Jim, we're going to you. Uh, Wayne in Milford has a question. He says, what is available to use on mites for houseplants, particularly angel's trumpet, which is very susceptible? Is there something that can be used on it while it's outside before I bring it in? And don't say insecticidal soap because that is worthless. And then there's the word that I can't pronounce. M. There we go. That's why you're the expert. I'm going to say uh, 
insecticidal soap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, the problem is insecticidal soap is effective, but you have to put on many applications and you have to get good coverage over every single leaf and stem. So unless you're willing to put on probably about four applications about every three days, Oh wow! And most people don't want to do that mm -hmm. because it's not effective on the egg stage of the of mite, and it does not have any residual. So you have to have the spray over the mite itself. Gotcha. So it, uh, that person, I think, if I were you and you want to use a different miticide, I would suggest that you buy a product made by a company called Bonide. B O N I D E. That company mm -hmm. has a wide selection of many materials, particularly for the homeowner. It's really hard anymore to find materials just for the homeowner. So Bonide is one co company you could go to the internet and find out. They have a whole list of chemicals. Then they have a material called Mite X, M-I-T-E dash X. Hmm. And it's supposed to be particularly effective on uh, mites. And it's one of these that's, uh, uh, you know, it's actually oils of uh, soybean oil and uh, I think, uh, what is the other ones, I think, uh, well, I think it's onion oil, I think, something like that, oh. but or, or garlic oil. So th it's an oil-based material, and I think that would be effective on the mites, so okay. you might try that. Again, though, that you had to get real good coverage, and you have to have several applications, I would say about every three or four days with the material, you get good coverage, and you get those mites under control. Okay, all right, thank you so much. And Kelly, you've got some show and tells for us. Uh, yes, I wanted to talk a little bit about pollinators. Uh, everybody's crazy and passionate about pollinators, and there's uh, some really great annuals that you must put in your garden if you want to attract those bumblebees, those uh, other native bees and butterflies. But I wanted to like talk about cool season. So we're, we're, we're in the stores, we're seeing these <coughs> cool season annuals mm -hmm. and pansies actually do attract butter, uh, bumblebees. And then we have the sweet alyssum, which actually blooms all summer long. It just does really well in the cool uh, weather. And it attracts um, bees also. You, they, are, they absolutely love this plant. It smells really good too. And then we have snapdragons, and actually snapdragons uh, were used to be only cool season, and now there's a lot of heat tolerance bred into them. But mm -hmm. um, snapdragons can be visited by butterflies and bees, but they're also the larval source, which means the caterpillars of buckeye butterfly will eat the snapdragons. So it's a great, these are three great um, cool season uh, annuals to have in your garden. And I also submitted a, a pictures of some of these. Uh, we uh, calendula. It's called pot marigold. It's kind of an old-fashioned plant that really needs to come back ah. because it is amazing like when marigolds. it comes to mm -hmm. attracting pollinators. And then I wanted to talk about three others. If you want butterflies, um, cosmos, Mexican sunflower, and zinnias. And these are really easy to start mm -hmm. from seed and they bloom all summer long and they're wonderful to have. They're absolutely gorgeous. Yes, and um, you can collect seed every year or you can go get transplants. Um, and then there's one that I did have a picture of. I um, took a, uh, a trip and I was at a botanical garden and took a picture of Spanish flag. And it's this really beautiful climber with these kind of orangish cream colored flowers and it kind of trails over. Uh, in the picture, uh, it's planted with some other succulents, but um, I've never tried this one before, but um, all my research shows that it's a great one for hummingbirds. Ooh. So that's the new one I'm going to try this year. So if you're in the stores now and you want to buy um, a cool season annual that attracts pollinators, these three are great. If you want to do for the middle of the summer, you have Cosmos, Mexican Sunflower, and Zinnias. And then, you know, try some new stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, most of the time, you in the stores, you can go to the growers, you can go to these garden centers, you can ask them, hey, has the, have these plants been sprayed? And they usually, when they buy from their growers, they know what chemicals have been used mm -hmm. on their plants. And so, and, and more and more people are asking that question. So they're prepared to answer 
yes, I've used an Emma de Cloprid on this, and if they have, then you don't want to buy that plant for a pollinator. But if they haven't used it and they've used um, more organic compounds, then it's great for a pollinator garden. All right, great things to remember. Thank Thanks. you, ma'am. Okay, so we're gonna take a break from the show and tells and uh, go to a segment that DJ, our director, and I worked on last weekend. A familiar face you'll recognize, Jennifer Nelson, Jen Nelson. We visited her house and uh, spent the afternoon with them as they are getting things ready for spring. Take a look. Hello again, we are wasting no time getting outside and getting busy. Spring has sprung and so now it's time to get those yards ready. We are joined today by a familiar face that you should recognize, Jen Nelson. And they are going to walk us through, she and her husband Chris are going to walk us through some of the things that they're doing out in the yard to get ready for spring and summer. So what are we going to be working on today? Um, today we're taking advantage of the beautiful weather and chopping down ornamental grasses. Okay. We always tell people leave them up for the winter because it's good something to look at mm -hmm. especially when there's a little snow on mm -hmm. them uh, it is key though to get them chopped down before they start growing again in the spring because that gets to be just a nightmare of trying to <laughs> trying to trim it out sure and they can be leave kind of a mess even after you chop them out so my husband's chopping them down and then he's going to burn the stubble okay so it's kind of like burning the prairie kind of thing <laughs> and, it's, and it's totally legal in town as far as i know okay so walk us through um sort of the technique and, and what folks at home need to do uh he's using this cutting tool that he found um locally he says it's the greatest thing since sliced bread and um, he's gonna just he's gonna cut it down in segments now when I've done this I've done it a little differently I've tied it with twine and just chopped one um, cut at the bottom and I've used the sawzall and uh, cut it off like in one big bundle he's gonna do it in segments because that's his way of doing it. It's kind of like chili. Um, <laughs> everyone has their own way of doing it. So Now once he gets this down, you guys burn it all the way to the ground? Is that what you're Yeah, doing? we're just going to burn out all, what, all the dry dead that's left. These are prairie gr grasses. They are tough. They are designed to withstand all sorts of abuse. They are a little, um, they are great for the yard for low maintenance. They are a little tough to move if you decide you want to move them. Um, you're not you're going to break several shovel handles if you try to dig it out with a shovel uh, we have used um, an electric sawzall actually when we wanted to take some sections of this out and transplant it into the backyard uh, you can kind of see what's happening with this one is pretty typical for ornamental grasses the center is starting to die out that happens over time so ideally what we should do um, after it starts sprouting a little bit and we know what we're working with is to cut out a section and transplant it into the center probably add some more compost or good soil to the center and just kind of rebuild it typically how long what's the what's the life uh, span on one of these plants or a section like this oh uh, we probably have to rebuild the center of it oh what every four or five four years, five years yeah but i mean the lifespan of these plants they're they keep going for quite a while. I don't. I've known nobody that has killed it, and I've known <laughs> some people that have really tried. <laughs> and this is one that you really want to be sure it's in a spot that you like it, because it is tough to move, and you will break shovel handles, like I said. It will thrive. It will thrive. It will thrive in Illinois. So that was a pretty cool segment we shot and we have more from that day at Jen's house that we'll get to later on in the spring. So we've got some folks who have been waiting patiently on the line. We're gonna go straight to those calls. We've got Bob on line two in Urbana with a question about a little beetle on the asparagus. Bob, are you there? Yes. Thanks for waiting, go ahead. Well, um, I get these little black beetles on my asparagus and they um, mostly it's like uh, the damage is, is, is visual you know, you can still eat the asparagus, but they're not too pretty anymore. And by the time you see these things start to show up, um, uh, you know, you're at a time where you're harvesting asparagus every two days or three days, and you kind of hate to put any kind of insecticide on it. What are they, and is there a way to deal with those? And they're little black beetles? Yeah. 
I'm not exactly sure because there are two different kinds of asparagus beetles, but they're a good size. And uh, one of them is very attractive. It's, it's got uh, sort of purplish uh, markings on it and uh, cream colored markings on it. And another one is sort of reddish with black markings. Those are called the asparagus beetles. And then they lay their eggs on the uh, spears themselves. You see them actually on like little stalks. So uh, how big, uh, how would you describe these other little black beetles that you see? Well, when I say black, I, you know, you, I think we're talking about the same thing. Um, okay. um, yeah, you see those, you see those, uh, the eggs they lay, and you can kind of rub those off. Yeah. Um, but is there, well, how's a way to deal with those? And um, Well, uh, you know, there is an insecticide called Seven, that you could use. I don't know if there's any botanicals that you could use. Seven is a, allowable on fruits or, or vegetables that you eat. You have to watch <coughs> the label. It gives you a couple days grace period between your spray and, and when you can consume the product. But I'm sure that then what you have is you call the asparagus beetle. I'm not sure which one you have. But you could just actually, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm an entomologist, so I don't care. I don't care if I eat the eggs or the larvae. Oh. <laughs> you know, you can take a little brush. Is that a protein? Yeah, hey, there yeah, you go. You just could more just protein. take a little brush and uh, brush them off. And the uh, I don't know for sure if these are labeled for asparagus beetles, but there's uh, azaractin and neem oil that are safer chemicals to use than the carbaryl um, that you could use. But... Uh, you know, I've been trying to do this thing where I convince master gardeners to use row covers mm -hmm. to prevent yeah. insect infestation. Yeah. So as soon as you see it coming up, if you put kind of a row cover, I know it's ugly, <laughs> but it still allows in sunlight and moisture. And then they just, they can't lay their mm -hmm. eggs on there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you just go pick it up, pick your asparagus and cover it back up. And that, and that can be, you know, uh, a lot of organic farmers use that method. And we're talking more uh, like in squash bugs and, you know, well, to do with, that. Yeah, and, you, you, and then, you, know, you can do that in the beginning. Like when you do plant your squash seed, you put a row cover over it. As soon as it flowers, then you can pull mm -hmm. the row cover mm -hmm. off, let it be pollinated. And by that time, the, the plants the, are so big that... A, and the bugs a, may be gone already. Yeah, but. it won't have that okay. huge of an infestation. Okay. Going to line four, Laura in Iroquois with a question about ring around trees. Go ahead, Laura. We um, we live on a small conservation farm, and we have this, boy, boy. I'll call it a ring of death. It um, It's the ring that it goes around two small bur oak, uh, like 20-year-old bur oak, and it kills all the grass and all the vegetation Thank in you. this big ring. Yeah, so it, it turns like a gray, and it, keep, it seems to be getting growing and getting larger in, in width. Yeah, it keeps growing out. I think we yes. call them fairy rings. And what, the, what it's doing, it's, 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 it, it's eating, there's, there's some type of um, organic material that, that it is eating, a fungus is eating or, or decomposing. But to do that, it's using up all the nitrogen. And so therefore the grass um, dies, but it'll just, I mean, there's not too much you can do that mm -hmm. you just put up with it and it, it'll eventually get so big and, and, and it'll dissipate. And, and eventually the organic material that it's eating will be used up too, so. Okay. Okay, we're going to, let's see, Kim with a question about growing soil. Kim, are you there? Yes. Hi, go ahead. Uh, I've had my soil tested by a fertilizer <laughs> plant, you know, in my area. And they said that my fertilizer in my garden is super, super good and in evidently high. So they said that I didn't need to put any more hog manure or whatever on that garden for many, many years. Uh, what's happened in the last couple of years is that I'm not able to grow potatoes or they they my potatoes grow and and sprout and then about midsummer they die my tomatoes I do get like a partial crop but they seem to die early and I wasn't able to I can't get 
cucumbers to to grow. I mean, they they want to grow and then they get about five inches high and then they want to start turning brown and die. Hmm. So your soil test came back good, but he's having trouble growing. Um, you know, they don't test for nitrogen in soil tests. They test for phosphorus and potassium organic matter. So, it, you know, nitrogen is like, you know, one minute it can be a certain way. So they're probably not telling you not to put a nitrogen-based fertilizer on there. They just are saying that, and I've noticed this trend throughout my work, is I'm seeing all these soil tests with these extremely high levels of organic matter and the uh, phosphorus and potassium, and I'm starting to like think about other plants that I can use that can pull that out of the soil. So I don't think they're telling you not to use nitrogen, especially on a tomato. Did they, did they test pH? Yes, and the pH okay. was in okay. like around seven, yeah. six point oh, nine. That's, so yeah, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I I personally, you know, in my I have a garden, uh, a, a jail garden that had elevated levels of everything else, but I still use a nitrogen-based fertilizer on some of my plants, my, especially my tomatoes. And so you just want that first number. You know, you want that first number to be high and those second two numbers to be low. Okay. Okay. All right, we're going to go to Betsy in Urbana with a question about plant removal. Go ahead, Betsy. Hi there. Um, so we uh, recently moved to Urbana. We have a wonderful house. Um, we have an established wisteria that is, um, it, it is sort of been connected to our deck. Um, and it has just been really hard to take care of. Um, and so I wonder how hard it is to get rid of. Um, I've looked on the internet, um, and it seems like it's, it's not an easy thing to do. So you, I wondered- You wanna get rid of the plant completely? Well, I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> See, I, I would, have, but you can cut it way, way back. I mean, Wisteria, can take a really severe, sometimes then you get better blossoms, really, if you give it a, it, it, it's kind of like one of those things where you take a, uh, an apple, if you it's not blooming you up and, and whack it a couple of times, it's, it gets a signal that I better do something here. And it's kind of <laughs> like the same thing with stereo. They do like, they do better if you do a severe uh, cutback most of the time. And I know if, if you let a wisteria go, it'll actually envelop a, a gazebo or oh, and wow. actually and be <laughs> very, very heavy. And if you don't have good structure, it'll actually call, collapse it. If you get a wind, there's so much plant material there, it, it can actually tear. So I would not be afraid to cut it way back. If you don't like it, if it doesn't do well, then you can cut it back to the ground and, and um, deal with it then. But um, I, w I wouldn't cut it out to start with. You'd cut it back after flowering or early spring? I, I would cut it back now because okay. I don't think it's set up, it's, it's, it, 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 it puts flowers on new wood if I remember right. Okay, okay. So if you've noticed, we haven't seen Kelly for a while on the show. Uh, you wanna tell the folks where you've been? <laughs> um, I had a baby Yay! and his name is Asher E. Alsup. There he is. Heffler. Um, three months ago, he was born, and I'm going to teach him how to garden, and he's going to love bugs. Good, good, One good, day good. he might be a professor. <laughs> good. <laughs> so uh, that's where awesome. I've been, taking and care of a baby. Absolutely beautiful. So enjoy. Thank you. Enjoy that little snuggle bug. Um, did we get through all of your show and tells? Did you? We've got no, about I've two got, minutes. If you, I've got, got one more here. Can we whip through it? Sure. Um, this I, I was out picking. You know, like I said, I like things that grow. This a, a lot of interest right now in this plant. This is uh, a ramp. Uh, it's kind of a cross between a a onion and a garlic. The only thing is you can use the whole plant. Uh, now you would cut the, the roots off, but everything else is edible. And the other thing I brought was I was digging artichokes. Mm. And these you kind of saute in butter like you would. Uh, potatoes are kind of bland tasting, but when you pair it with ramps, mm-mm-mm. -mm -mm. <laughs> John so, is the guy you get your recipes so, from. And, and the artichokes will get to be very big. They're in the sunflower family, so uh -huh. they'll get to be about six, seven feet tall. Wow. Ramps like shade, 
so there in the woody area mm -hmm. uh, right now is when they're coming up Chicago was named after this little guy the, the Native Americans used to call it Chicago and they were growing all over up in the Chicago area and that's how Chicago got its name was this very little guy. Very cool, very cool. But it's a, a ramp, and out in the East Coast, it's very, very big in the restaurants. Nice. I, I have never eaten it, that I know of anyway. <laughs> What's the flavor of that again? It's what a cross you between, it to? it's a mild onion garlic. Okay, okay. I could dig that. And, and like especially with, uh, and these are kind of like a potato or, yeah. uh, they're a little bit crispier, maybe like a, uh, a jicama or something like that. Gotcha. Okay. And it comes back every year. It, yeah. So you don't yeah. have to plant it. You just... It can be invasive. Enjoy it. We've got about a minute, so Could I wanted to... Oh, do you want to go ahead and mention yep. that again? Could go I mention it. this uh, train travel again? This uh, tour is called the Tour Group Planners out of Decatur, Illinois. Tour Group Planners, and the area code is 217-422-5002, and it's sponsored by WILL, and you're going to be able to sit in a dome car like shown on the model. Here. Nice. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for coming and sharing your time and expertise. Thank you for joining us, and catch us here again next Thursday for another installment of Mid-American Gardener. Good night. <laughs>